everybody knows about Sinclair and the ZX80. There's the lovely ZX80. And a lot of people know about this story, followed in the next year, the ZX81. But there was a machine that went before. It wasn't from Sinclair as a, as a company, it wasn't from Sinclair Research, it was from a company called Science of Cambridge. Um, and it's the MK14. And it looks exactly like that. Pretty basic stuff, not even the case on this one. So this came out in 1977. I mean, 1977, you've got to realise this is a couple of years before the ZX80, two or three years before this was launched. So computing, home computing, um, personal computing, was very much in its infancy, um, as you can see. And this isn't a great deal more than a calculator in, in some ways, um, but it's the beginning of everything in terms of uh, Sinclair and what they would do later on. Um, and there's a nice little story that goes along with it. So as with um, many things, sometimes the story is not quite what you'd expect it to be. If we take this magazine here, Computing Today. Computing Today, number one, was actually part of ETI, Electronics Today International, November 1978, this one's dated. Um, so very, very early on. But in there is an advert for the MK14. This thing was £39.95 to buy, plus 8% VAT, £250 in today's money, approximately, taking into account inflation. So it sounds really cheap, but really it wasn't. Um, and I can put that into context. So £39.95 for one of these. Um, we have over here a very early copy of Personal Computer World, uh, 78, same kind of era. At the back, we have a machine, for example, the XD Sorcerer. Brilliant machine. But this guy's very happy, as you can see. Z80 based, 32K computer. I wanted to spend less than a thousand pound. My sorcerer cost me 950. Yeah, 950 pound is about five and a half grand in today's money. Um, you know, and yeah, if you had that kind of money, you would be doing that kind of uh, thing on the picture. Seed one there, does it say a price there? 1,674 for that machine. If that's then money, not today's money. So that's even more expensive. They were used in education. Uh, they were used for research. Um, you know, th these we see, we do have to realize that these were the, the microcomputers. So mainframes and minis, they were, they were hundreds of thousands of hours to buy back then. You know, millions of pounds in today's money. So these were, you know, relatively cheap, relative being the, op uh, the operative word there, um, but very, very expensive. Most people couldn't afford these, these kind of things. Um, so Sinclair has always wanted to bring machines out that broke that price barrier, and not just by a bit, by a lot. The NK14 was obviously vastly cut down from any of those other machines that were out there. Um, you had this very, very simple touch keyboard there, an LED display, so basically a calculator display. You can only do sort of seven segment digits with that. It had 256 bytes of RAM, because that's not even a kilobyte, it's a quarter of a kilobyte. Um, so very, very limited RAM. But then, you know, with a keyboard like that, how much data are you really going to type into these things? How much did you need? Um, it was an 8-bit processor, um, had 12 bits of uh, address space. There, you could take it a bit further with an extra 4 bits as well, but you'd have to software program that. But it was pretty limited, but it was a machine that you could buy for 39 95 You could own this thing, and you could write the code that you wanted to write. So how did Sinclair, and I would say Chris Curry at the time, how did they come about with actually making this as a product. There was a guy called Ian Williamson, um, and uh, he came up with an idea for a microcomputer kit, um, and he saw the SCAMP design. So we have to look at the main chip. The main chip in there, there is the processor. This is the SCAMP processor. It's actually written SC slash MP, and it stands for Simple, Cost Effective, or one word, microprocessor. Two words. Microprocessor is normally one word these days. Anyway, um, SCMP, but it got known as the SCAMP. Um, and it was a, you know, an impressive little processor made by National Semiconductor. Ian Williams has seen the various designs out there, and this is a development system for the SCMP. And we also have quite a rare intro kit that you could buy the, this kit and make your own SCMP-based system. National Semiconductor produced this so that people in the industry could make their designs around it. And they had something called a reference design. So they had a circuit diagram Ian Williamson produced this board, again, based on that original design. Um, took it to uh, Clive and, and Chris and said, I've got an idea for a, a product that you might be interested in making. But as the story goes, we do have a video on our YouTube channel, which is an interview with Ian Williamson, that, so you can get this from the horse's mouth. But he showed this to the guys and they were interested, very much interested. Sinclair was probably more interested in the future of this, what it could become, because it was very, very basic. But Chris thought, yes, this could be a product. Um, so they said, yeah, this is, we're interested in that. That's an interesting thing that we might be able to market. Um, but 
when they went to National Semiconductor and said, OK, we want to buy a load of your scamp chips, um, National Semiconductor said, oh, well, what, you, what do you do with those? And they explained it and they said, well, actually, you know, we've already got the reference design. You know, we could supply you with those chips and the reference design. You basically just make that as a kit and sell it. So uh, Chris had to sort of go back with, um, you know, a uh, towel between his legs and say to, to Ian, well, actually, you know, really sorry. I know we've, we've shook on it, but um, we're actually going to go with National Semiconductor because they've given us a fantastic deal. Um, so we don't need your design. Thank you very much. Um, jog on. This guy has invented a, a design for a computer but there's one already existing. Um... Yeah, it was only based on the, the reference designs at National Semiconductor. But what, what it had done is it had seen this idea that actually, you know, the design is basically there. You can build upon this. And actually, there's a lot of people that might like to make this kit. So, you know, the, it's the idea, the initial idea um, um, came from Ian that this could be a product. So that didn't kind of work out um, for Ian, sadly. Um, however, you know, he would then go on to write the manual along with uh, Rodney Dale. There was money to be made in creating the manual and writing other books for it as well. So other books were produced about programming the machine and that kind of thing. I think we've got, there you go. Understanding the microprocessors with the MK14, Ian Williamson and Rodney Dow, both of who are trustees of the museum, I should say. So yeah, from the original design, and that's the kit that you could buy, you can see that there are quite big similarities. You've got the same chip, the original ceramic chip there, whereas these ones got the plastic uh, dips, um, same kind of memory. Um, and then you have a display here, an LED display with a keyboard. Well, that looks pretty similar to me. So you can see that um, progression on from the development kits through to uh, the board that was finally produced and sold. So this doesn't have the processor in it. The processor's there, you have this prototyping area. So what you can do is you can put any components you like there and wire them up. And then to program it, you would put your board into there. You can have different boards with different expansions, RAM or various other I.O., that kind of thing. And you could program it and make it do what you want. So this is the development system and they gave you all the supporting material. Yeah, so the programming manuals um, there. So you would have your manual uh, and you would learn about the entire instruction set. So again, you, what needs to be remembered here is that we are programming uh, in assembly language, in the machine code. So you are typing in hexadecimal numbers here that represent those commands. So at this time, Chris Curry was at um, uh, Science of Cambridge and was uh, really in charge of this product, project. Um, so later on, when Chris was at Acorn, interestingly, we have an Acorn System 1. Doesn't look that dissimilar. Same kind of calculator display there, hex keypad. Different chip, this one uses a 6502, which would be the processor that their next machines would use, the BBC Micro, the Atom, and that kind of thing. But, you know, it just shows how everything starts somewhere. Um, so the System 1, again, uh, a very rare machine, um, starting very, very basic, typing um, you know, uh, assembly language code in. And, and even that, you know, you think that assembly language would be a very high, uh, low level language that a lot of people wouldn't do. Um, however, if we take a look at home computing games programs on page 68, life for the MK14. So here we have a program listing for the MK14 and it, you can see it's the, the assembly language code, but that's the hex that you would type in. So at memory location OF20, you would type in C4, OE, and that would be effectively LDX. Conway's game of life. Yeah, so, but it's not really a game, it's more of a simulation. But then, you know, the machine could play this kind of, this basic game, and you could play other games on it. You know, the simple number games that you could do. I'm trying to work out what date this is. Oh, there, yeah, Summer 81. So 1981, and people were still writing code for the MK14 that was released in 77. So these things had a, a reasonable life. I'm not sure if anybody did type that in, but who knows? Somebody probably did. A lot of people were, were buying these things as the kit. So um, I have another thing over here to show you. This is extremely rare. Let's move that out there. So if you'd ordered one of these things, this is what you get. So this is an unboxing of MK14. This probably doesn't happen very much online. So this is a completely unmade kit as it would have been delivered. So part of this was the construction process in the first place. Getting the manual, getting the circuit diagram, understanding what all the components do, soldering them into their place on the board, soldering all of these connections. I don't know how many there are. There's a good couple of hundred there. So you'd solder all your components in place. And if you'd done it well, you've got resistors there, capacitors and things, uh, crystal. Um, if you've done it well, it will work. Um, and you could then start to program it. A really good manual with it that had, um, what we've got, greatest common divisor software, pulse delay, digital alarm clock, random noise, decimal to hex. 
So, you know, there, there were lots of things you could get it to do. There's even a, a monitor listing there. And interestingly, the chip had a, an inbuilt UART, so it had serial communications actually built onto the chip. So it was possible then to connect it up to a, um, a, another device to then see the output rather than just needing to rely on that very, very small calculator display. Um, so there was lots of things you could do. A lot of this is just demo software, just to show you the ideas behind programming, how you can use memory locations. So in machine code, what you're doing is you're saying, take this memory location, move it into the processor, add something to it, move it back to a memory location. Very, very simple um, uh, step uh, language. So that was defined as kind of programming at the bare metal. You know, you were talking directly to the chips, um, nothing in between. So you knew every single instruction and what it was for and why it was there, um, talking to those chips directly. So that gives you a really good understanding of programming computers. And if you understood how to do this, you could apply that to pretty much to any processor. The, the, the commands might change, um, but ultimately it's the same logical thinking process. So, you know, you could type in those things, those programs and get them to run. But also it has to be remembered that on the output here, you've got a port exposing the address and data bus and various control lines and things. And you could then have it controlling other things. This was kind of the Raspberry Pi of its day. You know, you had address lines there. You would put on an address decoder, um, create yourself some IO space and that could be sort of a, a, an address latch uh, or a data bus latch that you could then store data in and have eight outputs or 16 outputs or however many you wanted. Same way input, you could have um, a latch that then read inputs. So you've got some IO control. So from that, these things were then used for a number of purposes. One we have in the collection is a machine over here. It vaguely looks a little bit like an MK14. We've got the same calculator display there, same kind of hex pad. Um, but this is used for medical research. So this is just an MK14 in a big wooden box. You can see the MK14 down there. You can see the expansion chip. We have a tape interface there. And then we have some other malarkey gun on there. I'm not quite sure what that is. Power supply. You can just plug it into the mains. The power supply drops it down to about eight volts for the board itself. And this was used for medical research, controlling inputs and outputs, monitoring, um, and then analyzing those results. It'd be quite feasible that you could find out what somebody's reaction times is depending on how much they're drunk. Um, yeah, that would be a good use of this, uh, th this machine. Um, I have no idea if that's what it was used for, but hey, I might use that now. I was gonna say, we, don't, we need to do some research, I think. Yeah, absolutely, we'll do that later. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so these had genuine real world uses. It, it might seem that one of these things is pretty much unusable, but really not. You know, it was ultimately usable. If you wanted to control something, this, could have done it. There's a real world uh, use for it. Where they've made the box, made it portable um, and very usable. Uh, but then other people were just using it for their own fun, learning how to code, controlling their Hornby railway. I know people that had done exactly that with it. Um, so yeah, loads of different things. And you know, this was sort of 77. This was before most people were into to microcomputers as they were then. Um, so ahead of the curve. So sometimes your floppies would die, so you often would make backup copies. Um, let's try this one. Sounds more helpful. And so there was this game called Lander.